Good morning and Merry Christmas in St. Mary's Chapel at St. John's Church in Savannah. From John chapter 1 verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the sacred art of Western Christianity, the birth of Jesus takes place in a stable, a rather drafty structure of wooden posts, lintels, and rafters. But in the Eastern Church, its tradition is located in a cave, a dark, womb-like shelter in the earth framed by jagged rock, wherein the virgin and child Recline. In fact, caves are common in the limestone hills around Bethlehem and have a long history of use by humans for various purposes, including dwelling place and livestock. In the rather battered 6th century basilica, the Nativity was built over a small and rather claustrophobic cave identified as the birthplace of the Lord. There's another cave I want you to think about this morning, featuring in the famous allegory in Plato's Republic. In the depths of this cave are prisoners, shackled so they cannot turn their heads. All they can see are the flickering images cast on the wall of the cave before them by a, a fire and images in front of a fire behind their heads that they cannot see. For them to pass from the flickering shadows to light, from the illusions in which they're imprisoned to the reality, would require first their deliverance from chains, second that they turn around, that they convert so as to see the true cause of the flickering images they so long took for reality, and then to make the slow ascent and painful adjustment necessary as their eyes adjust to the blinding glory of the sunlight world above. Many of the prisoners refuse any liberation, preferring to take their illusions as reality so strong as to hold those illusions on their mind and will. But perhaps what also holds them is the fear that there really is no way up and out into the sunlit world, or still worse, no sunlit world at all. Perhaps as in some sci-fi dystopia, we would emerge from the cave only to find ourselves into some outside that was empty, dark, and even colder than our cave, a world indeed utterly indifferent to human flourishing. Well, Plato's allegory is a rather bleak picture of the human condition as one of spiritual bond blindness and bondage to unreality. But precisely as such, it's compelling call to seek those things which are above. It is compelling picture of our need for redemption to set us free, conversion to turn us around, and the sanctification of our souls, that by regenerate natures we may see the truth with spiritual vision, that we might live not by lies, but in the truth. To live by truth requires, first of all, courage. And courage above all, to be honest, rigorously honest, about ourselves and the lies that we like to tell ourselves and the illusions that we cherish, which hold us in prison. Well, that is a rather sobering picture to begin on Christmas morning. But it is the backdrop against which we may hear the Christmas Gospel of St. John as indeed good tidings of great joy to all people. John's Gospel tells us three wonderful things. First, John tells us, 
There is a sunlit world above and outside the cave, a world indeed far above our present experience and knowing, but nonetheless knowable, because God has spoken to us in his word. God has revealed that sunlit world in his word. And his word is the infinite wisdom by which all things are created, hold together, and are ordered in sweetness and in light. In this word is life, and the light is the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, did not overcome it, did not extinguish it. There is a tr in truth a world above, a reality radiant with light and life, meaning and purpose, in which human beings could flourish. And from this flows the second wonderful thing that John tells us, that in this word, this, the reality of this sunlight world is not distant, but near, not closed to us, but open to us, that we may be partakers of it, that we may share and live in it. And if we don't enter into it and share in it, it's not because it is close to us, but that we are closed to it. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so the third wonderful thing that John tells us is just how this can be so. How is it that we can be reborn? How is it that we can share in divine sonship? How is it that we can partake in the light of the sun of the world above? Well, we can't ascend into heaven to attain to the word, but he has come down to us. He has entered into the world he himself made. He has made his home in it. And he's done so by taking on human nature that is like ours in every respect, except for the blindness of our hearts and the stubbornness of our wills. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh. What an extraordinary thing to say. Because flesh, in the biblical account, usually means something, well, that is not word. It is dark, where the word is light. It is heavy, where the word is buoyant. It is sluggish, while the word is agile. It is flabby and weak, where the word is strong. It is blind, where the word is vision. So we might think that when the Word is made flesh, something will be diminished in the Word. Yet, in being made flesh, it's not the Word that's changed, but the flesh. Far from quenching the light of the Word, it is the flesh that becomes radiant with glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So that as we look at Him, we see what cannot be seen. On the other side, we might worry that in taking on our flesh, the word abolishes or destroys it, that our nature is impaired, that we can be kind of, that there's something less than fully human that is involved, but far from it. The change that the word takes place in our nature is nothing else but its deliverance from all that unmakes it, all that obscures and distorts its beauty and dignity. We see human nature as it was meant to be from the beginning. Now, in taking on our flesh, in his birth to the Virgin, what the Word has done, in terms of Plato's cave, is that he's descended into the cave that is our prison, and he's filled it with the reality of his splendor, to us who are in bondage to things visible, sensible, audible, tangible, 
The Word has made Himself visible, sensible, audible, tangible, so that by Him we might be caught up to the knowledge and love of things invisible, to the Son of the world of God. And so, in Him, in His descent, in His incarnation, the manacles are loosed from the prisoners in the cave. Their idols are exposed and overthrown. They lose their power. They ascend above, and our blind eyes are made capable of sight. Because the Word has been made flesh and descended into the depths of our cave, it turns out that even the cave itself is not our tomb, but a womb from which we may be reborn to spiritual life. But let us note just how deep is the darkness into which Christ must descend, how fully he descended into it. For it is an additional feature of Plato's allegory that he saw that the one who might descend from the world above back into the darkness of the cave in order to liberate his former fellow prisoners will experience rejection and death at their hands. What Plato did not see is that the one who so descends is the Almighty Word himself. And he is content to accept death that we might live, to suffer darkness at midday that we might have light even in our darkness. And because he has descended fully into our darkness, we are able to ascend fully into his light. And all that's required of us, because he's come to us where we are, is to behold his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. On Christmas Day and every day, our liberation, our conversion, our ascent, our sanctification, our transformation, our happiness is to behold his glory with the shocked wonder, delighted awe, and amazed recognition that we call faith. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thanks be to